The brutality of that time carried out under the extermination order by Kaiser Wilhelm and carried out by General von Trotha, for instance, was the most ruthless, ruthless campaign against an ethnic group that has never been seen in the history of mankind. Obviously, there is a part of me that will always look at a German and think, you know, why, you know, why did they do that? You know, digging up in all this, you know, will, will, even though I'm sure it will bring, you know, a lot of hurt, a lot of wounds and stuff to, to people, but I feel that, you know, the, the truth has to come out. We don't believe that what happened to the Jews in Germany under Hitler was just the madness of Hitler. It started in Namibia. For me, it was like, where do I really come from? Why do I somehow look so different from all the other Hereros? I, I really wanted to know how, how I got this light skin and my eyes and how, how did it come? And, and, and that is why I wanted to know where I come from. And, My name is Georgina Kachiongwa. I am a Namibian Herero. My people were almost exterminated by the colonizing German soldiers some hundred years ago. During this period, a lot of Herero women were raped by the soldiers. I am a descendant of one of these women. This is why I believe that my skin and my eyes are light. Das Jahr 1884 war mit der Erwerbung von Südwestafrika this is the little-known history of the Herero people in Namibia, who were almost entirely exterminated by German colonial troops between 1904 and 1908. It's also the story of Georgina, who descends directly from this dark, sinister past. Like countless other Herero women at the time, Georgina's great-grandmother was raped by German troops and, as a result, gave birth to a light-skinned child. Present-day Namibia is still marred by the atrocities of the past. German descendants of the colonial troops who wiped out 80% of the entire Herero population still have immense economic power in the country. This is the Namibia that Georgina grew up in a country that has one of the highest disparities between rich and poor in the world. The capital, Windhoek, is a prime example of Namibia's economic disparities. At first sight, one could be forgiven for thinking that Windhoek was a town in Europe. But behind this seemingly attractive facade lurk the harsh facts of its shameful foundations. Until 1990, when Namibia gained its independence from South Africa, apartheid laws forced the country's black population to live in slums far removed from the lush city center of Windhoek. Georgina grew up in Katatura, where Windhoek's African population was forced to live during the apartheid years. And this is the reality that she as a Herrera woman still faces. Already a mother of two-year-old Mwanza, Georgina has worked hard to make something of herself and, as a result, was awarded with a scholarship for the Cape Technicon in South Africa. Black tea, no, that's all right. I'm, I'm very proud to be a Herero, a Herero young lady. I'm very proud of it and I will definitely pass it on to my, to my daughter because she's Herero as well and, <laughs> and though she's mixed, but I will let her know about you know, everything that she needs to know about our tradition. And it's something that I'm proud of. I wouldn't say I feel different because of my, because of the color of my eyes or my skin, you know. Um, I feel like I'm like any other Herero woman. Though people, obviously, when they see me, they go, you know, they don't believe I'm Herero at, you know, first sight. But, you know, I don't believe that I'm different from any other Herero. I also feel it's important that 
you know, that I'm, I'm digging into this dark past because I feel that it is important for my history, you know. Um, I, I want to also know where I come from and what had happened to my people. And, and it's not only of my people, it's, it's, it's you know, the history of, of Namibia. I believe that each and every one, each and every generation that is to come has the right to know what, what happened in the history, what happened in the past. And that is why I feel it is important that we are digging, you know, and, and we're probably digging also for the generations to come, you know. I feel that if I can understand, I think that will help me. Even in issues that we're suffering today in Namibia, that would help us solve some problems, you know, we, we don't know. So it is very important for us to, to dig up in the past and see what did the Germans really do and how are the Herero suffering today that could actually be related to the past. In 1884, European states met in Berlin to carve up the African continent between them. As acting host of the Berlin Conference, Germany acquired a number of colonies, among them the unclaimed territory of Southwest Africa, today's Namibia. At the time, Namibia was home to hundreds of thousands of Africans who lived and thrived with their vast herds of cattle in the semi-arid landscape. But for the German politicians who were clamoring for more Lebensraum, living space, Southwest Africa was the perfect solution. German settlers who arrived in the colony regarded Georgina's ancestors as inferior peoples and soon proceeded to take away land and cattle from them. In reply, the Herero nation rose up against the German invaders, fighting to preserve their way of life. The war was embarrassing for the German Kaiser, who ordered the insurrection ended by fair means or foul and thousands of German troops were sent to the colony. The survivors, who comprised mostly women and children, were ushered off into concentration camps. Women were often raped in these camps, giving birth to a whole new generation of light-skinned Hereros. Among them was Georgina's great-grandmother. When the war was over, three quarters of the Herero nation had been exterminated. However, the few Hereros who survived the concentration camps didn't have much of a life to return to. All Herero lands and cattle were confiscated by the German Kaiser, who instead made this new Lebensraum available to incoming settlers. From now on, the Hereros would be little more than slaves on land that had once been their own. The first stop on our journey through Namibia is the Waterberg Plateau in the northeast of the country. Waterberg is an important landmark on Georgina's journey because this is where the mass extermination of her ancestors first began. In 1904, German troops closed in and attacked more than 50,000 Herero men, women and children who had retreated here in the hope of peace. As the trap around the Herero was closing, the Africans launched a desperate offensive that was met with intense machine gun fire. Those who survived the massacre were forced to flee into the merciless Kalahari Desert, where many thousands would die of thirst or exhaustion. The Waterberg Massacre has long been a point of pride for German-speaking Namibians. Local Boy Scouts with roots in the Hitler Youth Movement have through generations assembled for an annual remembrance ceremony at the foot of the Waterberg. The Scouts seen here were filmed back in 2001, paying tribute to the handful of German losses at the Waterberg battle and celebrating the victory that was won. Namibia's president, Sam Nujoma, cancelled the celebration saying that it was unacceptable to celebrate a massacre, which essentially was a genocide.
Georgina takes a quiet moment to reflect. Paul Hanasek, Simon Mayer, Mitch Monless, Ernest Ansorg, Oscar Schroeder, Basically what happened here at Waterberg was um, the Germans, when they came here to this country, they wanted to make it a German state, you know. And of course they felt um, they had to, not kill necessarily, but yeah, terminate the Herreros or the Damaras or the Vambo people of this country and make it their own country so that we don't have anything to say, see. And that was, there is a problem with colonialism, that somebody foreign comes to your country and tells you, you are wrong. It shouldn't be like that, you know, and this is what happened all over Africa. The basically Europeans came here and they claimed the country when the people decided to fight back. For the Germans it was like, how can you fight us? This is our country basically. And the people were do just doing their, following their instincts, you know. Basically it's your place and you have to defend it against foreigners and intruders. Jetzt kannst du richtig sehen, ne? Die Deutschen, die wurden alle hier begraben und für die Heroes haben die einfach diese Plakate angemacht. Damit man die gefallenen Herero-Krieger hier gedenkt. Ja. Für die Herero ist das nur so eine kleine Plakate hier und da werden Wo sind denn die Hereros begraben? Überall hier. Überall hier? Ja. Hm. Weißt du, und ähm, da hat man sich damals nicht die Mühe gemacht, halt so einen Friedhof vielleicht extra für Herero-Krieger hm. so zu schaffen. Ja, ich war nach der Zeit, und ich war nach der Although there are no visible graves of the Hereros, with the help of a local Herero guide, we're taken to the hidden grave of Chief Kambazembi, which lies close by. These Hereros did not die in the Waterberg battle, and our visit here is only a gesture towards the many thousands of Herero bones still scattered out there somewhere in the bush. I'm walking to the gravesite of the Hereros who had died at Waterberg in the war. Um, I don't know how to address my ancestors, how to do the ritual um, where you say that you've come in, in wellness. I actually feel very uncomfortable doing the ritual. I have not done it before and I have not been taught to do it or how to do it. So. Personally, I feel that it's it's more important the fact that you're there and you you've just come to give your respect and to just honor what what they have um, done in the past for this generation today. You know, when you look at this, I I feel that people today they don't want to to reveal the truth somehow. Things are just being covered up. I feel that. It is a part of the healing process, is bringing out the truth, putting it on the table, laying it down, putting it in people's faces, they gotta face it. Schwakopmund is a little piece of Germany on the South Atlantic coast. Schwakopmund, like Windhoek, is a tale of two cities. The township lies far from the affluent city centre. So far, Georgina's only seen a tiny fragment of her tainted past. All year round, German tourists flock here to enjoy a safe and comfortable environment in a distinctly German setting. This is Georgina's first journey to the coast and she's astonished by the blatant celebration of a colonial past. While tourists from around the world haggle about prices in the outdoor market, we stroll into Peter's Antiques. In Namibia, this shop is infamous for its glorification of German colonialism. Ich meine, 
ob wir nur weiß sind oder ob wir schwarz sind. Ich meine, wir sind alles Menschen und ich meine, wir leben nun hier im Land und wir kommen auch wunderbar miteinander äh, zurecht. Äh, in Swakopmund sind mehr die Deutschen zusammen, das ist auf jeden Fall zu sagen, ja. Aber ich meine, wir haben Bekannte auch aus den anderen Bevölkerungsgruppen, äh, ob, das jetzt, äh, ob die jetzt Englisch sprechend sind oder Afrikanisch sprechend oder auch Obambo sprechend. Ich meine, die Deutschen waren an sie nicht, wenn sie auf das hinaus wollen, im Prinzip Rassisten. Peter is obviously very fond of the old German meaning to the word. Aber auf jeden Fall besser als in Deutschland oder Europa. Hier hat man mehr Freiheit, hier hat man mehr Bewegung und hier hat man nicht so viele Leute um sich herum wie in Europa und im Großen und Ganzen viel mehr Freiheit. Only a few hundred meters from Peter's shop stood Smakopmund's concentration camp where thousands of Hereros perished under subhuman conditions. Many thousand dead bodies were carted from the camp to the desert, where they were buried in unmarked graves. By contrast, the German cemetery is a well-tended oasis. As local residents drive their beach buggies over the site, they're driving over concentration camp graves. An aerial photograph clearly shows neat rows of graves, but to this day, no one has ever officially observed their existence. Many Hereros in Svakopmund were even buried headless, because German troops decapitated the dead bodies in order to sell their skulls to museums and schools back in Germany. To clean the skulls of flesh, they forced Herrera women in the camps to boil the heads and to scrape them free of flesh with broken shards of glass. These heads could easily have belonged to friends or family members. Evidently, brutality had become so commonplace that the troops thought nothing of boasting their atrocious actions to the world. A popular postcard was produced that showed soldiers posing proudly with the skulls. As we proceed back to the capital Windhoek, Georgina asks us to stop the car. She spotted a Herrero herding his cattle across the landscape and wants to show us this important part of Herrero culture. In most of the Herrero families, you know, most of them are dependent on their, on their cows and their livestock. The Herreros are poor in, in a sense, but I mean, I know some Herreros that have so many cows, they actually got rich from that. Not rich as in really materialistic rich, and it's all because of the cows they have. I do have some cows as well that my dad is actually taking care of. I would actually put money in the bank instead of buying cows, you know, and it's something that my dad has spoken to me about. Well, you do have money in your account, but you know, you need to also buy cows. I mean, in my life, in the future, I, I do see myself as having, you know, my piece of land and with my cattle and my livestock. Back in Windhoek, Georgina speaks with her parents, who suggest that she should take part in the Herero Day of Remembrance, the Ochi Sarandu. The Ochi Sarandu festival is held every year in August and commemorates the victims of the Herero genocide. To take part in the event, Georgina needs to wear the traditional Herero dress. The three generations set out to buy material for Georgina's costume. I don't think they look a bit fat. I mean, it's just tradition to us and it's beautiful. I really love the way it looks. It's so different. 
from all the other dresses and so on and it's just beautiful really basically has the the hat which is made separate and then the dress with a whole lot of <laughs> dresses underneath the one on top probably like five more that you have to wear like just short skirts or just ones that you wear underneath to make it a bit round you know on on the sides i think it's beautiful it's it's really beautiful for me and i would love to wear one you know so as long as i can remember as long as i was young and i remember herero women wearing it and it's just getting better and better um you know they, they're really making them so different now more fashionable you know the colors and the the material they use it's changing now Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good. Her mother is proud to see her daughter taking an interest in Herero tradition. While her mother begins the complicated process of making the dress, Georgina goes out with us to the center of Windhoek to take a closer look at the German Rider Memorial. Local historian and former Minister of Transport, Klaus Dierks, explains the significance of the statue. Many of the Germans are not able or are not willing to really face their own past. Because if you are not able to understand what happened in the past, you will not be able to understand and to solve the problems in the future. And also here in Windhoek, where we are standing right now, because this place is somehow the symbol for the colonial time. It's the German golden square mile here between the military fortress, then of course the German Evangelic Lutheran Church, the Church of Christ, the Horse Monument, which is of course only memorizing the German part of the war, not the Namibian part of the war, and of course the government building. And on this place here, here was a concentration camp. Most of the German-speaking Namibians nowadays will not realize what happened here. But this church was built with slave labor. And the foundations of this church are founded on the bones of dead Namibian soldiers. And many, many executions also took place here on this site. <laughs> Georgina's dress is just about ready but she still needs the special hat, symbolically fashioned like a pair of cow horns. Herero traditions are slowly dying out, and Georgina's never before worn a traditional Herero hat. It's therefore a momentous occasion in her life. Although most Herreros at the Ochi Sarandu are quite old, Georgina is not the only one taking part in the festival for the first time. This year, I have myself also bought an Ochi Sarandu uniform because people have been asking, why don't I wear? And I was, in the, I was not in the country for 40 years. I came back just at the time of independence. But now I shall be honored at least to, have, to wear that uh, uniform. I have not participated before. I have always just gone in memory of, of, the, of the people who, who died, but I have not participated myself before. I wouldn't have really a specific reason why. It's just, um, I just felt that, you know, maybe I was, you know, too young. Thank you, Mama. Thank you. There are probably over 50,000 Herreros, some of them looking like you. My own brother, 
who was killed and buried in a mass grave here by the South African government troops and so forth, looked like you. When we walked on the streets, the police will always stop him and say, why are you walking with him? The, that's an angibon child, you know. I think it's a cultural thing. Hereros are, I think, basically very militaristic people, but not in a violent way. The Ochi Sarandu begins at first light on the last Sunday of August. Hereros from all over the country assemble in the small town of Okahanja, midway between Windhoek and Waterberg. The Herero people's military manifestations date directly back to the concentration camps. The surviving orphans were used as slaves by the German soldiers, hence the tradition of donning German uniforms. When Germany lost the colony to Britain after World War I, the children were set free and by employing German command structures, the young Hereros managed to regroup and recreate their tribe's social ties. So the annual Ochusarandu ceremony is just as much a celebration of Herero survival as it is a commemoration of the thousands who died during the genocide. We don't believe that what happened to the Jews in Germany under Hitler was just the madness of Hitler. It started in Namibia. It started from here. Goering started here as a governor. All these people have relationship to this country and what happened here. But what happened in Germany, it's a tragedy in the sense that, you know, Germ the German people in Germany were totally blocked out as far as what was happening in German Sudwest Africa under the Deutsche you know, Schutzstruppe. And they have been you know, executed by mad people. We don't say that all the German people are bad people. Just like we cannot say that all black people are good people. <laughs> they are good blacks, they are bad blacks. They are white blacks, I mean, they are white bad people, and also good white people. Well, why do you have light skin, both of you? Because of this guy. These are the people who used to rape our great-grandmothers. The procession moves towards the grave of Paramount Chief Samuel Maharero the main instigator of the Herero uprising against German colonialism. He chose to die fighting rather than becoming a German slave. It's a somber moment for Georgina and the others as they file past his grave. The procession then continues through the town and ultimately ends up at the graves of German soldiers. Even those who committed the Herero genocide are respectfully remembered at the Ochi Sarandu festival. We are standing here, the two of us, as offsprings of, uh, of uh, a, a culture of war of 1904 to 1908, you know. But we have no illusions about what happened in the past. We accepted what happened in the past, and therefore we lived it. You know, it's part of the hetero culture. Mm. These are the German offsprings from the old times. One of many specific customs at the Ochisarandu is the spitting ritual, which is entrusted to an old chief. It's a blessing to be spat at in this way. Hop. 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 I don't think I will wear this um, every day when I get older. <laughs> um, is this something I'm not used to and I feel like it's, I'm not comfortable in it. I can't move as much as I would want to. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the next um, Oshiterando next year. So. It's definitely not going to be my last. I really enjoyed myself and um, it was exciting just to be, I know I was probably like the youngest in that whole, you know, in the march, but it was exciting. It was really good.
The last part of our historical voyage takes us nearly 1,000 kilometers south to the harbor town of Luderitz. During the years of the genocide, countless Hereros were sent to this cold, insidious place. From the little she knows about her great-grandmother's traumatic life, Georgina believes that she was imprisoned on Shark Island. Those who died here were buried a few kilometers away at Gratzplatz. This railway track that I'm walking on, it's been built by Hereros who were forced to build this railway day and night. It, it must have been really sad because there, there were um, children as well who, who were also working on this railway. I've heard that, that there is a mass grave in, in the desert where these skeletons are and, and today we cannot go there and see these mass graves because it's now a restricted diamond area. According to the official German statistics, about two-thirds of all prisoners died in the construction of this railway. One corpse for every hundred meters of railway track. Eventually, we reach the remote and secluded town of Luderitz. We're greeted by the icy winds of the southern Atlantic. In this obscure remnant of the German Empire, the world's first death camp once claimed scores of victims. Here, Georgina's great-grandmother sat and witnessed how her friends and family died around her. Cold, miserable, abused and forgotten. There were five concentration camps spread across um, Namibia. The worst of them being right here in Luderitz on Shark Island. And this was Germany's first experience with concentration camps, an experience they would apply less than 40 years later in the Second World War. About 80% of the people put on this island died here. The Germans who were guarding the place gave it a nickname, the Tortoise Insel, the Island of Death. And it was not without reason. In fact, I found out that the colonial administration and the colonialists here, they cut off people's heads after they had died and sent them to Germany to be studied. And there they were applied to racial science, where people tried to make up all sorts of theories about black people being on a lower evolutionary scale because they had certain features that white people didn't have. And therefore tried to prove that they were different species completely with their own genesis, different from white people. So you see already 30 years before the Nazi era, you see racial science being perpetrated at this exact spot on, on Shark Island. We didn't learn about what happened at, at Shark Island. We, we never learned about this in our history. And I don't think in Germany, in their concentration camps, they would actually, after many years, make it as a campsite like, like we do have here. And people coming from all over the world, Namibians, some, some of them, you know, come here and, and enjoy this place like, you know, like there's happiness here. But in fact, there's so much sadness here. Well, how is it to stay here on Shag Island? It's very comfortable. The facilities are very complete. Last night it was very windy, but it was just a sea breeze. So we came in late from, uh, from the north, we pitched our tents, and we went into town to walk around. It's a very unusual town, more like the Wild West. These people lived here under really bad conditions, not having enough food, out here in the cold, close to the sea, it it's, can really get cold at night. And not having enough blankets, small children as well. It is really terrible to imagine what they were going through here. And they would be whipped 
you know, with, with stamp box and, and all that, and even the little children. I believe that is why a lot of women would go out in, in the town and, and just, you know, sell their bodies and do prostitution just to, to feed their families, to, to just give that little bit before they die, you know. And um, I can just imagine what, what the women must have gone through. It, it is really, really terrible. It is so bad. As an individual, you know, you would be sitting there and thinking, you know, you're probably going to be the next one. Maybe your day will be tomorrow. And you're looking at all these people that are dying and being thrown in the sea, and you feel like, you know, just giving the last little hope for your children. I mean, I can imagine the extent that a woman could be my great grandmother must have gone through just to keep her young ones to keep her children alive. It is important to dig up because I feel that, you know, the truth has to come out. People have to face this. People have to, to, to forgive. And, and obviously I'm not saying you forget. We obviously won't forget, but you have to be able to forgive so that we are able to reconcile. And I'm not talking only about the Herreras, I'm talking about the German side as well. You know, we both need to, you know, come to that stage where we forgive and look at the things that both happened, you know, the person who did wrong and the person who was done wrong to, and just be able to reconcile. <laughs>